Hello and welcome to the UFC talk show In The Cage, brought to you by Sportology TV with myself, Ali Drew, and my co-host, Uni. Guys, welcome to In The Cage, episode number two. Last time around, we had BT Sports' Adam Cattrall join us, and he spoke to us about Hoy Masvidal's loss to Kamar Osman and everything else to do with that card. But this time around, we brought in a, a well-versed journalist, somebody who's been around the MMA, UFC scene for a long time. He works for the Fighters Only magazine. He's had his work in many tabloids, many big papers in the UK, such as Independent. Let me introduce you guys to none other than Jim Edwards. Jim, thank you very much for joining us today. Hi guys, good afternoon. Great intro, maybe uh, sound great there. Uh, but yeah, exciting times in the UFC, no doubt. Big fight card this weekend. Of course, of course. Well, I just want to talk to you about last week. Um, obviously, the Rob Whitaker win over Darren Till, it was close. There's a bit of, you know, people said it was, you know, it was very close and there's a bit of debate about it. How did you think that fight sort of went in with the, all the anticipation of it? Yeah, I think it... Um, played out kind of as we expected it to. I think we all knew it was going to be a very, very close fight and, and that's the way it kind of ended up being on Saturday night. Um, obviously, Robert Whittaker got the unanimous decision. The judges thought he won three out of the five rounds, which I think is absolutely, um, absolutely a fair score. I scored it for Till. I actually saw that he won uh, rounds one, four, and five. Um, slightly different to the actual judges' scorecards, but um, yeah, it was a good fight. It was everything we, we expected. I think it all hinges, and that decision, and the, the, the kind of sway from round to round, where some people say Till won, some people say Robert Whittaker won. I think it all goes down to round four, which was an, an incredibly, incredibly close round. Very, very hard to score. If you look at the three judges' scorecards when they came out, um, I think they actually differed, um, two, two out of three of them differed between rounds four and five. So look, in, it's mixed martial arts. There's always going to be discussions around decisions. Saturday night was great evidence of that. It was a great fight between two of the best middleweights in the world. And this time, uh, Robert Whittaker was the man who got his hand raised. But I think, uh, I think it's fair to say both, man can, both men can leave the, uh, that, that fight with their head held high. And I think there's big things um, in the future for both of them. Well, what is next, do you think, for both of them? Well, uh, I think um, if we start with Robert Whittaker, uh, I think Robert Whittaker had been previously just beaten by the now champion Israel Adesanya, who will be fighting Paulo Costa uh, in September. So if he's going to wait at that out and see if he kind of can get that rematch right away, then he's probably looking at the, the back end of the year. If he's, if he's hungry to fight again, if he wants to kind of get back in there as soon as possible, there's a few contenders. I would say namely people like Jack Hermansen uh, from, from Sweden. He's, uh, he's recently just beaten Kelvin Gastelum and put himself in the kind of mix himself. Um, but if I was Robert Whittaker, he's been champion before, I think he'll wait it out. I think he'll wait to see who wins out of Adesanya and Costa. And I, I think that's probably the best move for him. And I think that's the one that he will do. When it comes to Till, Till, Till's a bit different. So Till apparently has hurt his knee during that fight. And he thinks, and it's not been confirmed, I haven't spoken to him since Saturday, he thinks he's going to require surgery. So he could be another one that's kind of on the sidelines for a bit. Maybe he'll return before the end of the year, maybe he doesn't. But who he fights then will be really, it'll be, it'll be dependent on what else has happened in that middleweight division. So either way, it's not particularly clean cut, but I think Robert Whittaker is probably going to get that title shot next. You, the defeat hasn't lowered till stock at all, though, I don't think. No, not at all. I think you look at the, the feedback from Saturday night and the reaction to it. I think everyone thinks that he gave a great account of himself. Uh, as I said, Robert Whittaker was the previous champion and he pushed him just about as far as he could go. And, um, you know, he, he was dominating in the fight in the first round came awfully close to winning that decision. Um, there's actually a website called MMADecisions.com, which a lot of us journalists use to actually uh, send in our scores and they kind of aggregate them all. And 10 out of 20 journalists thought he won it. So it was split 10-10. So look, there's just as many people that think that Till won that fight. The fact is, though, that Robert Whittaker won it. Um, I think Till has, has genuinely, you know, he's, he's in a good position still. He's in a great position. He's still one of the biggest names in that division. I still think everyone would love to see Darren Till versus Israel Adesanya, the current champion. I think, as he said on Saturday night, he's one win away, one big knockout away 
from putting himself back in the title talk. So absolutely, I think he his stock has is, is not uh, is not really gone down whatsoever. I want to talk about the undercard, Jim. Um, it was dominated by veterans. Uh, yeah. the, the, the main undercard, uh, Mauricio Shogun Rua, defeating Anthony Nogueira. Um, Mixed reaction again. Uh, I look on I look on social media. There seems to be a mixed reaction. How did you see that fight? Yeah, absolute throwback with that fight, wasn't it? It's like two absolute legends, like you say. And um, you know, it was funny because it felt almost a bit out of place uh, on the card because there are some, you know, some really, as we'll probably come on to talk about, some really exciting kind of youngsters that were ha- almost having some of their first fights in the UFC. So. And to see to see that kind of third stanza between uh, Shogun and Little Nog was, I, I per- personally wasn't looking forward to it going into the fight. I think you know they're both, um, you could say in the far 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 latter stages of their career, and they're both seeing um, better days. The fact is they put on a great fight. Again, it was it was very very close, and I think um, for me, I think yeah, Shogun probably did deserve to get his hand raised at the end. He dominated the end of that third round. And I believe it was probably one all kind of heading into that. So it's, I think he stole the third. Um, he was the one who got his hand raised. I, I, you know, I don't really want to see either of them fight on any longer just because they're very long in the tooth. They've been in this game a very long time. And as you guys know, it's, uh, it's not exactly a game you want to stick around for too long in. And they frankly, between them both, have had way, way, way too many fights. It's, it's a great decision from Little Nog to hang up the gloves after. He, he can certainly, again, he's another person who in defeat on Saturday can leave with his head held high. He gave a great account of himself at, uh, I believe, 41 years of age, which is, yeah. which is just crazy to think about. Yeah. But for me, Shogun was the, was, was the rightful, rightful winner on Saturday. Uh, we had a heavyweight bout. Um, we had Big Gus. Alexander Gustafsson, move up to heavyweight for another, you know, veteran, someone who's been around the scene for a long, long time in Wadoom. Um, I, honestly, I didn't expect that myself. I, I didn't. I think a lot of people that I spoke to prior to the fight thought that Gustafsson would actually just win that and maybe make his mark on the heavyweight division. Um, that wasn't the case. Just, just talk to me about that fight. Uh, absolutely not. I think you, you weren't alone there in thinking that. I think Fabricio Vadum is another one that has you know, reached, reached an age where we'd like to think that we've almost seen some of his better years. And I think Alexander Gustafsson, who, who had retired, who had retired and was coming back, moving up a weight division, um, people thought that he almost had a new fire lit underneath him. And as the, the king of Sweden was back, as they were kind of saying in the Swedish media. Uh, it didn't turn out that way. Absolutely not. Fabricio Vadum looked um, fantastic. Fantastic, and like, and that's very you know unique for us to kind of say that in this stage of his career because he certainly hasn't looked that way in a, in a number of years. He looked fantastic. He he got the submission in the first round. Gustafsson looks slightly out of his depth, I would say, at heavyweight. Um, I don't know if he will continue to pursue the, this kind of heavyweight run. I mean, Fabrizio Vadum, as we were saying, is probably you know, probably getting outside of that kind of top 10, top 15 in terms of the heavyweight division lines up right now. So whether Gus still thinks that he has it um, within himself to make an impact at that weight division um, kind of remains to be seen. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is Vadum's on now played out his UFC contract. So he's now effectively a free agent. He's a former strike force champion. So he kind of has that connection um, with Scott Coker, who owns uh, Bellator, or is the president sorry, of Bellator MMA. So Perhaps we could see him in Bellator. We, we know there's one championship over in Asia. have got a lot of money right now. Risen as well in Japan as well. They, they're known for uh, spending the big bucks. So Fabrizio Vadum, out of nowhere, has suddenly kind of put himself as one of the, the hottest free agent um, kind of products out there in, in MMA right now, which is um, surprising to say, because like you said, I very, very heavily kind of favoured Gustafsson going into that fight. But uh, it's heavyweight MMA, right? Um, we should have known better. Anything can happen, and on the night, Vadum was the man who uh, was the man who, who kind of proved us all wrong. You know, there's a lot. Of, there was a lot of fights on that card that we could really go through and analyze. So I don't really want to go through every one of them, but there's a certain few that I want to talk about. First of all, Tom Aspinall, uh, Darren Till's teammate, coming coming in for the first time. There's a lot, of, obviously, talk about him, a lot, of, a lot of hype about him. But man, did he produce on the night? did he produce just talk to me about his 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 performance on the night yeah i mean this is uh this has been a long time coming for tom 
Big Tom, as they call him down at Team Carbon, he's, uh, he's a phenomenal athlete for a heavyweight. He moves like a, he moves like a middleweight, and he's actually one of Darren's main um, sparring partners, which, um, you know, that goes back to Till's welterweight days when he's fighting at 170 pounds. Like, Tom Aspinall has been in the UK, talked about as one of the kind of hottest prospects on the scene with a very, very serious... Uh, boxing background as well. I think you guys know that he was um, he sparred Tyson Fury to kind of help uh, Tyson prepare for some of his fights. Um, you know, which is pretty phenomenal to think about the the differentiation in terms of the striking in both boxing and mixed martial arts. So that's incredible to think about. But he's also a BJJ black belt as well, so he can handle himself on the deck. So when you combine those two things together into one single fighter and you add in the movement that he has, you, you have an incredibly um, exciting fighter to look at. And I think on, on Saturday night, poor Jake Collier, who was moving up, uh, moving up from light heavyweight. He, he was another former light heavyweight who found it not so easy when you get into that kind of heavyweight division, even though it was Tom's first night under the kind of the bright lights of the UFC. Having also just seen his teammate as well lose minutes before he got into the octagon yeah. what a performance like you couldn't have asked for more just very very clean striking got the tko got fifty thousand dollar bonus like it couldn't have gone any better for tom aspinall on his debut and he kind of confirmed what a lot of us knew already here in the uk that it's going to be a serious threat in that division and it's not exactly one that's overloaded with talent right now so tom could be making some big waves very very quickly uh, before we talk about the man that everyone seems to be talking about online, and I don't want, I don't want to say his name at this present time, I want to talk about one of the Scottish fighters I fought on the night. Paul, I like to call him Triangles Craig, who who loves to, who loves loves his triangles. But he he fought a good opposition, Anti Um and you know what? That was a that was going to be that was supposed to be a really tough tough fight for him. But again, he pulled it out of the bag. He's he seems to just be getting these finishes in the way he does. Just talk to me about him and what sort of talent he is. Yeah, Paul Craig is a, is a unique, unique fighter. Like, um, you know, previously um, in the UFC London before last, he, he was literally won a fight in the last second um, against another Russian opponent, again via a triangle, four minutes and 59 seconds on the clock in the third round where in a fight he had essentially been losing incredibly, incredibly badly. And that fight essentially won him his new UFC contract, which he's kind of playing out now. And since then, like, look, Paul's a guy that um, if anyone's a better out there, you probably wouldn't be putting your money on Paul Craig to win a fight just because like every single fight he's in seems to go one way and then the other. You can never guarantee anything with Paul. The, the one thing you can guarantee with him is that it's going to be exciting and that he will commit um, to submissions on the deck and like the, there's a lot of fighters when that when they're put on their back especially in grappling exchanges you, you just can't see how they're going to get out of it you can't see the, their way to winning a fight well for Paul it's completely the opposite that's where he almost sometimes wants to be and that, that's where he's his most dangerous and he kind of proved that again on Saturday night again getting the submission victory that a lot of people didn't see didn't see him actually being able to pull off but again he just sinked in that triangle beautiful another beautiful submission to add to the record Good on Paul Craig. He's one of the good guys um, in this MMA game. And I'm just delighted to see him con continue, continuing his journey, really. He uh, didn't, I, I know for a fact he didn't expect his kind of UFC tenure probably to last this long. But we were talking about Shogun Rua earlier in that co-main event. I think we need to see that rematch. I think we need to see that Shogun versus Paul Craig rematch, which was so exciting the first time. I think that's the fight to make. They both come off the, the, the night on Saturday with big wins. Let, let's see. Let's see that fight again. It was great the first time, and I think it would uh, produce another exciting fight uh, in in the kind of rematch as well. And I wanted to save this guy for last uh, in regards to the card that we're talking about, and that's uh, Chimaev. Comes out Chimaev, just phenomenal. Like I don't know, it, it seems to be someone out of a movie. He's just come in and he's just destroying people. I know he's only had two two fights whilst he's been here, but the way he's done it, he's gone from middleweight and then tenders there for. How well to weight, just dropped down the pounds, and it was just convincing. And there's this big hype around him. He's obviously build, building this hype around him with his performances. But just talk to me about comes out Chimaev. Yeah, I mean, what a talent, right? He was somewhat on our radars as a prospect, having been fighting in Brave, knocking people out in an organization called Brave FC. But 
no one could have predicted the impact he would have had on Fight Island. He, I think he leaves by that kind of Fight Island period, that four weeks, with um, probably the most, the biggest rise in stock. Everyone knows who this guy is. He even got a reply of Conor McGregor on Instagram when he started looking at him yesterday. And that's, um, that's just a sign of the, the kind of waves that he's made. He, he's the guy that's, um, that kind of leaves the island with the most hype. And it's, it's justified. It's, it's almost as if someone kind of took some of the DNA from Habib and thought, hey, if we were going to make this guy fight at a different weight class, what can, what can we do here? Well, we'll possibly make him a bit taller and uh, maybe kind of finesse some of his striking skills a bit more. He's a, he's a dangerous prospect. He seriously is. He's got a serious amount of confidence confidence in him and you know i was working for a swedish outlet for, for a very long time a few years ago called mma nits and these guys were already talking about him ages ago just because they knew from his training and his sparring sessions with people like alexander gustafsson and all the guys that train out of all stars gym um, in stockholm he's been on the radar there in sweden for a very very long time and i think the last two weeks we've um we've got to see how special he really is and generally, I think with talent like him, we always think, hey, let's kind of, you know, let's build him up slowly. I don't think this guy's going to wait around, though. I think he wants a top 15 opponent next. I think he wants to fight as, as much as possible. And I, I, think, I, I don't think it's out of the question that within a year's time that, he, that he's flung in there for a title shot. I think he's going to have to be because I think he's another who people are just not going to want to fight. They've seen what he did to Paul Reese McKee, who is, uh, you know, he's a... A hell of a talent like hell of a talent he's been on the UK and amazing for a very very long time and again he's another one that would strike fear in people's hearts when you mention that you're gonna to have to fight Reese McKee and Reese had like you know very very short notice six days to prepare for him but speaking frankly he didn't have anything for him on Saturday night he lifted <laughs> Kai, Kai, sorry um comes out lifted him up dragged him over to his corner and then beat him up in front of his own team, which is just crazy to think about. The level of control that he had in that fight from start to finish. He's a very, very special talent. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of him in the next year as well. You, you spoke about it there. Um, how do you build somebody like this? Because he's coming at 100 miles an hour. He's absolutely, he's not even beating opponents. He's actually just, the way it's just, it's just brutal. Some of the, like, <laughs> these two fights have been brutal, to be honest. He's absolutely battered them. Um, <laughs> But what do you do? Like you said, all right, top 15, maybe in a year's time, if he just keeps doing what he's doing, he's got to have that world title, right? There can't be no other way, right? Well, look, look, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. He is a hell, he's a hell of a talent. He's proven that he's got an awful lot of skill in kind of everything that he does. He's, he's done everything that has been asked of him so far in the UFC, absolutely impeccably. And also, if you look back at his brave fights as well, like a serious amount of first round finishes as well. I think, look, let's, let's kind of hold the reins a little bit. We're all so excited about him. We almost want to yeah, see him fight yeah. every day. And I think if it was up to him, he probably would. But let, let's see. Let's, let's, give him a, uh, let's give him a top 15 opponent. Let's see how he does. Like, let's see. We haven't seen him in adversity yet, which is such a big thing for a fighter. What happens if, um, you know, what happens if he does get rocked in a fight? What, uh, what, um, what sort of attitude does he have? Does he have the fighting spirit within him to be a champion like Robert Whittaker on, on Saturday night and getting, getting knocked down in the first round, and not just even just surviving, but adapting your game plan or fighting back and getting that win? Let's see him in a few different situations first. He was in a pretty favourable one on Saturday night. Reese McKee, six days notice. Cam's that have been on the island already for, for two weeks. Was acclimatised, was ready. It's fine. He's done well. I'm not downplaying his height at all. I just think, I think we need to see a bit more of him before we can call him a future world champion. Jim, I just want to ask how you think the UFC is sort of strived in the current conditions. Comparing it to sort of sports like boxing, the UFC sort of kept going, got started a lot quicker. It, it sort of seems to have handled it a lot better than other sports. Yeah, yeah. I think in the early stages of covid with the ufc and like it's worth calling out for the fact that these guys are a bit like manchester united they're leveraged by, from their owners by serious serious debt and they've got a huge mortgage to pay every single year so they effectively need to keep it business as usual they have a huge contract with espn their network provider in the U in the us where they're contracted to deliver a certain amount of events every single year and if they deliver that they're doing well that mortgage is more than paid off they're making a ton a ton of money so for them, their prerogative is to put on events. It doesn't matter 
who's fighting almost doesn't matter who's fighting on them they just want to get those events done so in the early days of covid it was when it was panic stations about how the hell do we get events done there was talk about having events on Indian burial grounds in in the US, harking back to kind of like the early days of the kind of un, unsanctioned sport that would later be known as mixed martial arts and basically just pulling out any stops, any venue, anyone that will take us. We haven't really figured out what safety protocols we need. We're just going to get these events going. And that was shut down by ESPN, who essentially said to them, don't do this. We don't want to see these events happening because you know we've got a brand and reputation to look after as well. They're owned by Disney. So it then, a few weeks later, um, transpired that the UFC went to Jacksonville in Florida, which again was one of those states that didn't have, they hadn't locked down. Um, there was very kind of raw, a few rules that they kind of had to abide by through that. And they started implementing and trying to work out how do you put on safe events during COVID, especially mixed martial arts where it's such a you know, heavy contact sport. And like some of my fellow reporters went there and they said, look, look, it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but they, they were pretty close. It felt safe there. They were doing a number of tests and then Fight Island came along where um, I think, this, I think they've really set a standard. Like you talk to people that were over there, the safety measures they went through, I believe they conducted over 18,000 tests in four weeks. Um, every single person that was going there was tested before they left with the results coming in. As soon as they arrived, they had more tests and just throughout their stay on the island, just consistently testing, making sure that it was a real bubble around Fight Island as well, trying to ensure the safety of fighters. And I think whilst we were well within our right to be um, condemning them in the, in the original kind of stages of them trying to get the sport back on its feet, I think now we have to stand back and applaud them for what they've done. They've done very well. They created a safe environment. They um, had a number of, they had four events in a matter of weeks. No one tested positive for COVID on the island and things look to have done, been done very safely as well. So hats off to them. I think they genuinely are setting some of the standards that um, people are now abiding by. So yeah, well done to them. It was, uh, you know, it was no mean feat doing that and they, they certainly did a great job of it. Jim, I know you've got to go in a very short while, but I just need to ask you one quick question before you leave. UFC 252, Daniel Cormier, DC, versus DP Miocic. Um, yeah. Give me your thoughts on that. How do you see that fight playing out? Yeah, like, wow. It, it, look, it's one of these great fights that we get to look forward to. I think it's happening in, what, three weeks' time. So, look, one all in, in the series so far. Cormier winning the first fight via knockout, which I think to everyone at the time was quite a big surprise. Um, and then, obviously, Miocic kind of levelling it up in the second fight and actually coming, um, coming more into that fight late on and finishing it. Uh, very late on to level the score, get his title back. And now we've all been heavily anticipating this trilogy fight, which is going to happen in a few weeks' time. So I hate to say, when it's one all and you've kind of seen both guys beat or one another, it's very hard to say who you think is going to win the third stanza because they know, they both know they can beat the other man. They've done it before. Yeah. However, I favour Miocic going into this. I think Daniel Cormier is another person that has has had... Um, his sight set on the end of his career for an incredibly long time now. It's almost like a year and a half and injuries and all sorts of has stopped that from happening. And he does get to take to the octagon one last time to try and win that heavyweight title. I don't think he's going to do it. I think, I think Miocic kind of worked him out of it in that last fight. And um, barring any situations that and kind of any any kind of um, scenarios that have played out in terms of their preparation for this fight that we don't know about, you know, how well have they all been able to train for this? Have they had the right training partners? Has COVID affected anything? Are they injured? Barring anything that we, you know, that we can't see, I, I favour Miocic heading into this one. I think he'll defend his title. And what I think that will be in, in terms of a knock-on effect will be, I don't, think Mio, I don't think Cormier will retire either. I think he'll want to go out with his head held high and I think he'll want to do that by going out. Um, with a win as well so um, yeah great fight great fight coming up one to look forward to this month because there's some cards that are coming up as I said the prerogative is just to get some of these cards out there and like some especially the one this weekend you look on that and there's not much star value in terms of the name selling the fight doesn't mean they won't be worth watching but call me Amy Ochich is the one to watch this month definitely very exciting well thank you so much for your time Jim it was great speaking to you 
Yeah, no, thanks, guys. Um, thanks for having me. And no doubt uh, I'll be back to uh, talk to you again very soon. You will be. I hope we'll, so. Yeah. We'll definitely <laughs> want to talk to you in the future when, when, we, when there's a few more cards announced, definitely. Thank you very much, Jim. Really Good stuff. Good. Cheers, guys. Take Appreciate care. it. Thank you. Thank you. Great to talk to Jim Edwards on episode two of In The Cage. Make sure you stay tuned. We've got lots more coming up. Make sure you like, subscribe, leave some comments and hit the bell button so you get those notifications. See you next time.